everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk about fabric. I think that a lot of people out there, particularly those of you who maybe are just starting your costuming or sewing journey, can feel a little unsure about what kind of fabrics you should be looking for, for what project, or even how to tell the difference between various types of fabric. So I hope to address all of that in this video. I'm primarily going to be focusing on fabrics used in costuming just because those are the fabrics that I have in my stash. We're going to take a close up look at a whole bunch of different fabrics so that you can see the drape, the weight, the weave, and even in some cases hear the difference between different types of fabric. I do want to preface though, I am not professionally trained. <laughs> Everything that I've learned about fabric has just been from my own personal experience of doing historical costuming for over 12 years. In that time, I've worked with a wide variety of fabrics, enough so that I can often tell what a fabric is just by touching it. I think that that's a skill that comes from lots of practice and experience, and I know that for those of you just starting out, it can be a real challenge. So one way to really kickstart your fabric knowledge is to just start touching, feeling, smelling, hearing, etc. a wide variety of fabrics. Go to your local fabric store and go down the aisles and just touch the fabrics. Pull the ends out from the bolts and study how they drape. Rub them between your fingers and listen to how the fabric sounds. Now obviously, if you're in an area like I am, this is only going to help you with certain types of fabrics. In my area, I have access to Joann's, which means I'm fairly limited to things like quilting cottons, poly taffetas and satins, cotton canvas and twill, fleece flannel, and various other fabrics, most of which are not the preferred fabrics for historical costuming. But you know what? Most online fabric stores do swatches, and a whole lot of them offer either free or very low cost swatches too. So getting swatches of a whole ton of different fabrics is a great way to learn what fabrics are what. It will be really challenging to see the drape of a fabric just within a swatch, but you can still learn what a fabric is like by feel, sight, sound, and even possibly smell. You can also perform burn or bleach tests on your swatches, though I will touch more on those types of tests later in this video. Make sure that when you receive your swatches, if they're not already labeled, which they should be, you immediately label them. You could keep them in envelopes sorted by type, like wools, silks, cottons, etc., or you could staple them to swatch pages with their information written next to them, such as type of fabric, cost, where you got it, etc. This way, if you're unsure what type of fabric you might want to use for a project, you can go back to your swatches and see what will work best. Another option, in addition to ordering swatches online, is to get a copy of the All About books. I mentioned these books in the My Favorite Costuming Books video that I made last summer, but these are super, super helpful books with a page on pretty much every different type of fabric, including a description, care instructions, and an actual swatch of the fabric. Unfortunately, these books are out of print, so they can get pretty expensive, but if you're able to get your hands on them, I highly recommend it. There's three books in total, all about wool, all about cotton, and all about silk. Now, I do want to say before we dive into the fabrics that I do not believe that there is any one right or wrong fabric to use in your sewing. There are certainly fabrics that will work better than others or fabrics that will be more comfortable to wear than others, and I will try to mention that as we go through the fabrics in this video. But also, everyone is working with different budgets and a lot of us have varying access to the different types of fabric. So even if say a silk taffeta would technically work best for a certain project or is more historically accurate, that does not mean that you have to use that expensive and possibly hard to find fabric on your project. If what you have access to is poly taffeta and that's what fits in your budget, go for it. I'm going to be separating this video into three main sections, cotton, silk, and wool, and comparing each of these to their potentially more accessible alternatives. I will try to show you a bit of linen as well, but 
I can't really speak much on linen because I've actually only worked with it a couple of times and I have very little of it in my stash. To be honest, I'm also one of those weird people who kind of hates linen, which I know is like blasphemy to historical customers, but every time I've worked with it, it has been a pain to sew with, plus it wrinkles like nobody's business, and it comes in all sorts of weights that are hard to comprehend unless you are actually feeling the linen, and since I can't get it from my local shops, well, you see the problem there. And I know I should take my own advice and swatch the different weights of linen, but... Since I don't like sewing with it or wearing it anyway, I frankly haven't felt the need. In fact, actually, since that's practically everything that I have to say about linen, let me just go ahead now and show you what little linen I have. Most of these were purchased way back in the beginning of my historical costuming journey because I had learned by then that linen was a very historically accurate fabric, but I had not yet learned that I don't like it. <laughs> Linen is made from very fine fibers from flax plants. And you can see here that I have a few different weights of plain linen plus one specialty linen. Other than the specialty linen, which is woven in a herringbone pattern, the key characteristic of these other plain linens is that the weave is very visible. This is why generally when working with linen, you'll want to draw a thread as in pull it out of the weave in order to find the grain of the fabric. Lighter weight linens are a bit on the sheer side, but all of the weights do have a bit of body to their drape, as in there's enough stiffness where they don't just fall straight down. Unless you have quite a fine linen, there will be a bit of roughness to the texture, and frankly, even a finer linen like this one is not entirely smooth. The herringbone linen looks lovely, but was awful to work with because it was extremely shifty. Linens also wrinkle extremely easily. Generally, if you are looking in a local store like Joann's, you will find that linen there has been blended with rayon or cotton, and if they do actually have 100% linen, it will be very pricey. However, you can find it for much more reasonable prices online. Historically speaking, linen was the choice fabric for undergarments until about the mid-Victorian era when cotton became more popular. It's also always been popular for summer or lighter weight garments. That's about all I have to say about linen, so let's move on to cotton. In my opinion, cotton is the best fabric to use, particularly if you are new to sewing or if you're on a budget. There are many, many different types of cotton, but generally most cottons are easy to sew with, they're breathable and comfortable to wear, they're easily found in any fabric store, and they're less expensive than other historical options. The cottons that I'm going to talk about here are the cottons that I use all of the time, going from the heaviest weight to the lightest. So first, cotton canvas. I mostly use cotton canvas to make corsets or other such structured items like those taller, stiffer Edwardian belts. Canvas has very little stretch, it's very stiff and thick, and it's very durable. You can find it in a lot of different colors or prints, even at some place like Joann's. The next heaviest weight that I use is cotton twill. Sadly, the twill that Joann's currently sells has gone way down in quality and weight, and I much prefer their old twill. I'm looking for a source for that hardier twill, which of course is pretty impossible without being able to feel it, but in the meantime I'm making do with Joann's new twill. Twill has a diagonal weave on one side of the fabric with a flat weave on the other. And I mainly use twill to interline bodices, but I've also used it to interline 1890s skirts and also as the exterior fabric for a dress, which was my Hussif dress from 2020, and even to make my Regency corset, though that was the heavier stuff and I still don't really recommend twill for corsetry purposes because it does have a little bit of stretch to it. And of course, you often see it in more modern clothing such as skirts and pants. It's less stiff and lighter than canvas, but the good stuff still has more weight and body than any other cotton that I'll be talking about, while being much more malleable than canvas. Twill is one of the fabrics that I buy in large quantities because I use it so often. I also like making bodice mock-ups out of it since it has more structure than old sheets, say. At Joann's, you will unfortunately only find twill in white and black, but you can find other colors online. 
Moving on to more mid-weight cottons. One cotton that I don't actually have in my stash and have never actually sewed with, I don't think, because I don't think I've ever seen it at Joann's and therefore I have cheaper alternatives, is cotton poplin. If you're familiar with Ishakti, a lot of their dresses and skirts are made of cotton poplin, which has a nice stiffer structure and body, but is still quite smooth and thin. For example, this skirt is made of cotton poplin. You can kind of hear the rustle noise of it, and it has a fair amount of body to it. For a good alternative that's more accessibly purchased, we have quilting cotton. There are various weights of quilting cotton, but if you're in some place like Joann's, the heaviest or sturdiest would be something like Kona cotton. Kona cotton is great, honestly. If you don't have access to twill, Kona cotton works great as bodice interlinings, and if you're making more modern or vintage stuff, I would recommend using Kona cotton instead of twill for your interlinings. It has a plain, smooth weave, which still has some structure even after you wash it, and it comes in a variety of colors. Also, a lot of the printed quilting cottons that you find at Joann's are approximately the same weight as Kona cotton. Lighter than that would be something more like Country Classics cotton. I don't tend to use this unless I can't find the right color in Kona because it just always feels a little less durable, but it might be a good choice if you're looking for something a little bit lighter weight. Editing Rebecca here, I forgot to talk about one other important cotton which we I'm sure are all used to working with, which is cotton muslin. Muslin comes in white or unbleached, as in sort of an off-white, and is a lightweight fabric that is soft to the hand. So it's kind of the same weight as like a country classics cotton, but it is soft and it feels soft both if you rub your fingers over it, it has a soft drape, and of course we are most familiar with muslin, and I'm talking about the muslin that you can get at the fabric stores, not the muslins that you can get if you are working like kind of more commercially sewing, but the muslin in the fabric store is soft and we use it for mock-ups and such like that, but honestly it's not the best for mock-ups because it's so soft and thin. The muslin that they use in sort of more commercial or theatrical sewing circles, that is a much stiffer muslin. I'm not exactly sure where to source that, I'm guessing it's available somewhere online because people use it all the time, but that is a much stiffer muslin that has a really kind of a firm hand, firm drape, and that is great for making mock-ups, which is why it is used in those more theatrical settings. It's very sturdy and works great. I don't have much experience using it, but it tends to come in just the off-white color, that unbleached color. So that's muslin. Now back to non-editing Rebecca. A cheaper alternative, which I don't necessarily recommend other than for mock-ups, and even then, in my opinion, you're better off using sheets from the thrift store, is Symphony Broadcloth, which is a cotton poly blend. This is kept right next to the Country Classics cotton, and therefore, in my opinion, it is very easy to accidentally grab when you are looking for 100% cotton, but again, you are much better off paying the extra dollar or so per yard and just getting the 100% cotton. The polyester makes it less breathable, even though the fabric is thinner, and you can also see the poly content in it because it has kind of a weird sheen to it. Next up on the cotton list is one of my favorite cottons, Cotton sateen. Cotton sateen is great for linings, and in particular, I use it frequently for sleeve linings, even if I'm doing the rest of the bodice out of Kona or Twill, because I like the way that my arm can just nicely slip into the sleeve. Cotton sateen is a softer cotton. It's lighter weight than Kona or even Country Classics, and one side will appear quite shiny. The amount of sheen can vary depending on what type of sateen it is. For example, a few years ago, Joanne stocked one that they called Supima Cotton Sateen, and it was gorgeous. Like, so shiny that it could almost pass for matte satin. I'm still a little bit bitter that they discontinued it, to be honest. Currently, sateen can be quite difficult to find in Joanne's. It usually only comes in white and black, it's not a ton shinier than the Kona cottons, and they literally just mix it in with the other cotton solids, so you have to keep a really keen eye out for it, or you have to read all of the bolt labels to find it. Historically speaking, by the way, bodices were actually lined with polished cotton, which had a weight that was closer to Kona cotton, but was shiny like a sateen. However, this is nearly impossible to find nowadays, so 
If you do know a source for it, please do share it with everyone else, including me, in the comments. Let's move on to lightweight cottons. I think there's often a lot of confusion between these cottons, and they're all pretty popular in historical costuming. First, we have cotton lawn, which is a crisp shirting weight fabric with a smooth finish. It's usually opaque, but it's lighter weight than any of the quilting cottons. Next, we have cotton voile, which I have also heard pronounced voile. I say a voile. Voile is lighter weight than lawn, but it's still pretty crisp and smooth, and it's also usually semi-sheer. And finally, one of the lightest cottons I've worked with is cotton batiste. Batiste is super fine, airy enough to just sort of like float, and it's usually semi-sheer. Any of these three fabrics can be found in historical sewing purposes. Lawn would make for really nice summer weight undergarments, and all three would be great as a chemise a Lorraine, though I'd probably lean towards wall as the best for that. There are also other lightweight cottons such as gauze or net, but personally I don't have experience working with those more specialty fabrics. However, the one cotton fabric that I think is a must for any historical customer is cotton organdy. Cotton organdy is an amazing fabric. It is super stiff and yet very lightweight. The stiffness comes from processes applied to the fabric as opposed to the actual weave or the fibers of the fabric though, so that does mean that after a handful of washes the stiffness will unfortunately go away. However, it is still the best fabric out there when you're trying to give silk more body. For example, it is a perfect lining in 1830s sleeves and skirts, and it also works pretty great for 1890s sleeves unless you're working with a very heavy exterior fabric. This is another one that I buy by the bolt, though unfortunately my favorite resource for it, which was Vogue Fabrics, no longer seems to carry it. So if any of you have a recommendation for where you buy your cotton organdy, please do leave that comment down below. Another popular cotton fabric is cotton velvet, and I want to take this time to compare three common types of velvet as we transition from cotton to silk. First, the velvet that you see here is cotton velvet. It's a heavier weight with a much stiffer drape than other types of velvet, and it can crush pretty easily. <laughs> it's also not particularly shiny. All velvets have a nap, so if you run your hand over it, it will feel very smooth in one direction and a little more prickly in the opposite direction. Because it has more body though, cotton velvet is much less finicky to cut and even to sew with than other types of velvet. Speaking of other types, one popular kind is polyester velvet. There are different qualities of polyester velvet. There's the really cheap looking stuff that is readily available at most fabric stores, but that will not feel pleasant to wear and generally looks cheap when made into a garment like this velvet. But there's also what seems to usually be referred to as micro velvet, which is still polyester, but it has a little bit more body and a more luxurious look. And from my experience, it's far less crushable than pretty much any other type of velvet. You can sometimes find this micro velvet at local fabric stores, but this is also really readily available online and it's a lot cheaper than silk velvet, especially if you get it online. It's also easier to work with than silk velvet. It is definitely more shifty than cotton velvet, but it is far less shifty than silk velvet, which can often feel almost like a liquid. Honestly, micro velvet is a great middle ground, and it can still look very rich and expensive when made into garments, though it can still be finicky to sew with. Lastly, as I mentioned, there is silk velvet. Nowadays, what we think of as silk velvet is almost always a silk rayon blend. It looks very luxurious, but it is so slippery that it can be a real pain to work with. It's also far more expensive than its polyester counterparts. However, silk rayon velvet is also very dyeable, so if you are looking to dye a drapier velvet, you will definitely want to opt for silk over polyester. You can also dye cotton velvet though. So since we're on the topic of silk, let's go over other popular types of silk. In general, silk is going to be much more expensive than its polyester counterparts, but there is something about the feel and drape of silk that is nearly impossible to duplicate in any other fiber. As historical costumers, we're probably most familiar with silk taffeta. 
Silk taffeta has been used throughout the ages for finer gowns, particularly for evening wear, though you see plenty of day dresses made out of silk taffeta as well. Silk taffeta is lustrous, but not shiny, and it is a smooth fabric with lots of body, even though it's very lightweight. It has that lovely scroop sound when it rubs against itself. And one of the key characteristics of any silk fabric is that there's a real softness when you just rub your finger over it very, very lightly, as opposed to a stickiness when you do the same to polyester. Silk taffeta has a very even weave and there are no slubs or imperfections in it. It comes in a wide variety of colors and patterns, but is really only readily available online unless you're close to a resource like the LA Fabric District. In the Fabric District, you can find silk taffeta for sometimes as low as about 12 or so dollars a yard, but if you're looking online, you can expect to pay upwards of 20 or more. Keep your eye on Fabric Mart fabrics for less expensive silk sales. Lately, they haven't often had the taffeta, but they do have the following two fabrics. First, Silk Dupioni. Now, if you're going for historical accuracy, you don't actually want Dupioni because in the past, Dupioni was thought to be an inferior fabric because it's filled with slubs or imperfections throughout the weave. Nowadays, however, Dupioni is cheaper and more readily available than taffeta because it's often preferred for evening wear or home decor, as the slubs are now a sign that it is silk. It has a little bit less body than taffeta, a rougher texture due to the slubs, and the raw edge on silk Dupioni will fray like nobody's business. A slightly lighter weight, slightly less slubby alternative is silk Shantung. Shantung has less body than Dupioni and less slubs. Often a patterned Shantung can visually pass for taffeta because the slubs that are there will easily blend into the pattern of the fabric. However, the lighter weight and the less body give it away that it's not taffeta. Similar to Shantung, but usually with no slubs at all, is Thai silk or tissue taffeta. Thai silk is usually much less expensive than taffeta, has a slightly rougher weave, and due to its lighter weight, usually has to be flatlined with another fabric in order to give it more body if you're trying to use it in place of regular silk taffeta. Also, Thai silk often comes in a narrower width than silk taffeta. Silk taffeta is usually about 56 to 60. Thai silk can be 36 to 45. So you do have to be careful when you're thinking about fabric requirements and also prices since you'll wind up needing more of it. It can be a good alternative though if you don't need the body of taffeta and you're on a slightly tighter budget and you can occasionally find it in wider widths as well. There's also silk satin which is a gorgeous fabric and usually quite expensive. Silk satin is a little shiny and very smooth, and the closest polyester alternative would actually be matte satin or bridal satin. Sometimes you'll find double-faced silk satin, such as this one, where you actually have a completely different color on each side of the fabric. Pretty much all of these aforementioned silks, with the exception of the velvet, are honestly quite nice to work with. All of them have enough body that they're not tricky to cut, and they sew really well as long as you're having a sharp needle. Silk will be quite warm to wear, even though it's a lightweight natural fiber, and it is harder to clean than pretty much any other type of fabric. In fact, unlike cotton, you pretty much never want to pre-wash silk, as it will lose its body and can even actually damage the fabric. I missed some other silks too that I don't have a lot of experience with, but this is a silk brocade. You can see the texture in there, gorgeous and the reverse side of it looks like that. So you can see kind of the strings going through it a little bit. And then there's also things like silk jacquards where there is that texture put into it. So those are more specialty silks. Not all silks are as nice to work with as the ones I've previously mentioned though. In historical costuming, there are some other commonly used silk fabrics first, China silk fabric, also known as silk habitai. Forgive me if I'm pronouncing that wrong. China silk is a lightweight, plain weave, slippery fabric that is often used for linings. It's not very shiny, but it is very shifty. Another very shifty silk is silk charmeuse. 
Silk Charmeuse is basically liquid. It's incredibly shiny and incredibly slippery and will shift every which way when you go to cut it. Silk Charmeuse is not super common in pre-20th century sewing, but it is one of the favorite fabrics of the 1930s. I, however, am not a big fan of the 1930s, so I don't actually have any Silk Charmeuse fabric that I can show you in my stash. Moving on to even lighter silks, we have Silk Organza. Now, Silk Organza is incredibly lightweight and sheer, but it also has amazing body. It is fantastic for those sheer 1830s oversleeves and the big frilled lizard caps of the 1830s and 1780s. Silk Organza is wonderful if you're ripping it on the grain, but good luck cutting it in any other shapes without it shifting all over the place. Despite its body, it still manages to be very shifty. I buy my Silk Organza from Dharma Trading. It only comes in white or black there, but the prices are excellent and organza can be easily dyed without really changing the makeup of the fabric, unlike a lot of other silks. By the way, when I'm talking about resources, you will find all of those resources down in the description below. If you really want to punish yourself, you can work with silk chiffon. <laughs> I don't actually have silk chiffon to show you since I don't hate myself that much, but this is polyester chiffon, which is somewhat similar in that it is also awful to work with. Both versions are sheer, slippery, and floaty with virtually no body. You will not enjoy cutting it nor sewing with it, but as long as you stay away from things that can snag it, you will probably enjoy wearing it because you'll likely feel like a floaty fairy tale princess or Kate Winslet running through the Titanic in her white dress. One of those. Other very light silks include silk gauze and silk net, which can both be used for decorative purposes and are common in Victorian and Edwardian fashions. I don't have either of these silk fabrics to show you though, so you'll just have to imagine some very fine fabrics. However, I do have a fine net from the Casa collection at Joanne's, which I believe is a nylon net, but to be honest, I can't really remember if it's nylon or polyester. However, it does a great job at pretending to be that lovely silk net that the Victorians used to decorate their outfits. Frankly though, all this talk about fine silks in the middle of January is making me feel cold, so let's talk about cozy wool fabrics now. I have to be honest with you, I don't use a wide variety of wool fabrics, so there are way more types out there than what I'm going to be able to show you here today. The heaviest wool fabric that I use is wool coating. Wool coating is a thicker wool with a plain weave and it has been fulled, which is a process to shrink and tighten the weave, which makes the weave thicker, denser, and more compact. I'm currently working with wool coating to make my Daniel Deronda writing habit, which you will see in next week's video, and also my project after that, which is a new winter coat, and that'll be made out of wool coating as well. Another wool that I frequently work with is wool flannel. Flannel is thinner than wool coating, and it's usually very soft and fairly drapey, but still with a good amount of body. I love wool flannel and they have loved wool flannel all throughout history as well. It can be slightly harder to find than suiting wool, but I found that you can actually take less fuzzy or fluffy suiting wools and make them more fuzzy or fluffy by washing them and tossing them in the dryer since that actually works a little bit like a felting process. This can give a slightly thinner wool a bit more of a flannel appearance. Speaking of thinner wools though, there are lots of different wool suitings that are pretty readily available, though most commonly these come in suiting colors like navy, gray, black, brown, and maybe ivory or a subtle pinstripe or hound's tooth or some other muted shades of blue. It can definitely be a lot more difficult and more expensive to find wools in brighter, more fun colors. There are of course a lot of other wools out there, even something as fine as wool gauze, but I personally don't use anything besides suiting flannel and coating, so I have none of these other types to show you. Again, kind of like silk, since wool fabrics can be very challenging to find and source in person, I recommend requesting swatches from online retailers of various types of wool so that you can see and feel the difference, particularly if you can't get your hands on a copy of All About Wool. 
By the way, wool is the reason that I mentioned using your sense of smell to identify a fabric, because wool actually has a very distinctive smell. It can be a kind of a faint smell when it's dry, but it is quite an odor when that wool gets wet. Besides using your own senses to distinguish what kind of fabric something might be, you can also perform burn and or bleach tests to determine the fiber content, like I briefly mentioned before. These are not always super conclusive, but things like the color of the flame, the smell of the burnt fabric, the quality of the ash, and most obviously, if your fabric beads as it burns, meaning it's actually melting, not fully burning, those are all indicators of a fabric's actual makeup. There is a great burn test chart from By Hand London that I've linked down in the description, which will help you identify all of the clues when you perform a burn test. A bleach test can be used to identify protein fibers like wool and silk, since protein fibers will actually dissolve in bleach. Both of these types of tests can be good if you really care about your fiber content in your fabric, but honestly, looking at the drape and feel is, in my opinion, <laughs> the important part. Does it drape like how you want it to? Do you like the look of it? Will it feel comfortable to wear? If so, then frankly, who really cares about the fiber content? So again, the best way to learn how to differentiate fabrics is through experience. Get out there and feel fabrics. Play with their drape if you can. Collect swatches. Eventually, you'll be able to simply feel and see what is the right fabric for your project and what types of fabrics you like. And that's all that really matters. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this video and that it was helpful for you. If you want to really take a deep dive into different types of fabrics, Nicole Rudolph has a series on her YouTube channel where she does just that, so I will link those videos down below as well. And if you liked this video, please be sure to click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other costuming content like this out on Saturdays. But I post every day over on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram. That's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my Edwardian level patrons, Sharon and Julie. And also thank you to Julie for suggesting this video topic. See, my patrons get a little edge in suggesting topics too. <laughs> thank you all so, so much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful week and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!